Um, so, the Lord led me back to Joshua chapter 14. We're going to look at the Revised Standard Version. I like that translation better of the original Hebrew. I think it's important. So your Bible's got, got the NIV, but it's, it's very close. So look, look there, please, with me. Uh, Joshua 14, verses 6 through 14. Um, God brought me back to this passage, and specifically to the man uh, that is Caleb, that we see briefly in the Old Testament. And I believe that God has something for us today in the person of Caleb that's very significant. So let's look together at God's word. I'll read for you. Please follow with me, and please do have your pew Bibles open. We're going to be in the word together this morning. The word says this, Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. Now, now, the word for wholeheartedly here is actually better translated fully, completely. Okay? This is, we're in the NIV. Um, the NRSV has got fully, completely. So I want to hold on to that word. So on the day that Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord, my God, fully or wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Since the time he said this to Moses, when Israel moved about in the desert, so here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as as the day that Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me the hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. You yourself heard that that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he has said. Verse 13. Then Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for an inheritance. So Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly, fully followed the Lord, the God of Israel. I want to remind us also of one other passage, 1 Samuel 16, verse, is it 17 or 7? Which one is that? No, it's 7 then, I think. It says this as as Samuel is looking for the king to replace Saul, which will become David. He says, the Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. There's the the full verse. Let's bow together. So Lord, as we come back to a familiar passage, as we turn our eyes to Caleb, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would see, that we would see what you want us to see. Lord, help us to see how this matters for our lives today. Let us treasure the example of Caleb and find how we can grow through it, through this text. We thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God's been putting on my heart the importance of spiritual maturity in the church, how important it is that we are spiritually mature as we navigate life together. And and we see... 
a great example of spiritual maturity in the person of Caleb. You know, standing in faith is something that can be hard. Anybody have, ever have that experience? Standing for God, standing in faith, standing by your convictions? I mean, it can be easy when things go well. Something good happens and you say, God, you're so good. We praise you for all those good things you're doing. Uh, we got excited this week. My daughter started, or last week, my daughter started kindergarten. And there's six kindergarten classes in our public school by our home. And so we went in and we got a teacher and we got what everyone told us was the best teacher in the whole school. It's good news, right? And she's really sweet. She's great. We really like her a lot. She has a, she has a cross. She's a Christian that she wears in class. Big deal to us, you know, woo, great. So we're so excited. We go home, God, thank you so much for a good teacher who's sweet and sends nice emails and has a cross and loves Jesus. Yes! Right? But what about when things don't go as we'd like? I mean, what happens when we do what we're supposed to do, but things don't go like they should? Do we find it hard to praise God then? I remember when I, when I, was, in a, when I was in high school, I, um, a friend of mine took me to a, to a party. He said, you've got to go to this party. I'm like, I don't know. I don't really know the people. I don't really know the person that's having the, the party. I don't know that I really want to go. But, you know, I go anyway because he wants me to go. And we get out of the car, and the house where the party was going to be was actually an abandoned house that had been closed down. And so the police grabbed us. It's really fun. To have plainclothes officers drive their elbow into you and treat you like you're some kind of criminal. I didn't do anything. How come I had to get pushed around and interrogated like I was some kind of a thug? It can be hard to thank God when things are hard. And I think what we see the most about Caleb in this text is a man of great character. And we see the importance of character to God. The importance of, of what we do when things are hard. We live, we live in a world where the Christian faith is, is a challenge to take seriously. Um, if you turn on TV, if you look at the culture, the things that we stand for in the Word of God are not celebrated by the people in the culture that we're in. I mean, you can't watch a modern TV show or movie without having, um, you know, uh, premarital sex and, and sexual uh, recklessness everywhere. It's just part of what is done. When I counsel couples, sometimes they come in and, and it's not even, it's, it's an afterthought. There would even be waiting till marriage with a lot of folks like the word calls us to. Being faithful. Waiting ourselves, honoring God with our bodies. And, and, and so, we, so we live in this world where the enemy, I believe, is, is, is hungry to get us to buy into lies. You know, we have a very powerful God for whom anything is possible, and yet the enemy wants us to think that he's not able, that he's not good, that he's not with us. That when something bad happens, God doesn't care, he's not around, he's not present, and he just is powerless. And I have sat with many people who have wrestled with that. Something happens, and, and they pray, and something bad still happens, and they say, well, then God doesn't love me. Or God's not able to heal. Or God doesn't care. And it can be a challenge to, to stand by God's promises even in hard situations. We say, God, we know that you are at work for our good. We know that you are able. So, so how can we get to the point where we pray for someone to get healed, they don't get healed, yet we can continue to believe that God can do anything? How do we get to that point? We see in, in Caleb a man who does everything right and yet is punished because of the choices of others. It can be hard 
to worship then. The enemy wants us to believe that, that God's not able or that we can meet in a church and have a meeting and discount or cut out part of God's word because we don't like it or it doesn't match our cultural stance. And so God calls us to be something bold in a culture that likes to blow with the voices and the winds that are blowing. And who here likes to be attacked or made fun of for what they stand for? Anybody? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in conversations with folks, and I know it's going somewhere, and I know they're going to come around to me, and I'm like, oh, I've got something else I've got to go do. Because you don't want people to say, you don't, you don't agree with what we want, you don't stand up for what we want, and we don't like you anymore. And we live that way now. I mean, people, I've seen so many arguments at coffee shops over politics, or over stances, or who supports what. And against that, God says, God says that we're to be something that transforms the world. God says we're to be something that transforms the world, that as we stand for God's promises, God's goodness, as we pray with boldness that God is able, God shows up and does miraculous things. And we're called to stand for that kind of stuff. We're called to stand with conviction on the promises of God. We had a, a couple in the last service, uh, Scott and Jamie Archer. I was going to try to show you their video. We're, we, can't, we can't work because it's through the Internet. Um, because of our system that we've got. He was, Scott Archer's brother was 32 years old, had a massive heart attack in his front yard and fell over. His neighbor just happened to be coming home at that time, took a route he, took a route he didn't normally take. So he showed up at just the right time, gave the guy CPR, took him to a hospital that had just opened five days earlier. And he was able to get whisked in, got the medical attention that he needed. Still, his organs were failing. We prayed for him two weeks ago, and, and, and a time came where he just healed. His body came around. And even in the news article, the, the doctors talked about, we're not quite sure what happened, but he's doing great. You know, and, and, and Scott, when he went out to see his brother, he called me on the phone, and he was so overwhelmed with grief. He said, my brother's 32 years old. He's got three small kids he's raising by himself as a single dad. This can't happen. You know, and the church prayed, and, and we prayed together, and others were praying for him. And I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that man woke up with organs that functioned because God healed his body. Because God says that's who he is. Yet in the church, so much of the time, we want to keep it safe and, and contained. We want to say, okay, well, one plus one equals two, therefore God does this. But not that, because we can't really explain it. And we want to reason away the word of God so people don't have hurt feelings. But I don't believe that's, that, that's, our, that's our place as a church. We come to this verse, 1 Samuel 16, 7. We see, it when, we see it when Samuel goes at God's order to find the new king for Israel and he sees Eliab, who is David's older brother, and he's handsome and chiseled and looks like he belongs in a soap opera, you know? And, 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 and Samuel runs over to anoint him with oil. And God stops him and says these words, Don't consider Eliab's appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Throughout time, God has always, always, not called the qualified, but qualified the called. He qualifies the called. And he calls those who have a hunger and a desire to be faithful and to follow him. And so we come this morning to Joshua, who's sitting there 
with Caleb, and Caleb says to Joshua, remember 45 years ago when I was 40 years old? And we went and spied out the land. Remember the promise that Moses gave me? Remember the promise that Moses gave our people? And some of us say, well, what's that promise? We find that in Exodus 3, verses 16 through 17, up here. God tells Moses, he says, go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done in you in Egypt. Verse 17. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt. Okay, I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites a land flowing with milk and honey. So God promises his people this land. And Joshua and Caleb are there. Now think about it. I mean, they saw some things that are kind of remarkable. Okay? They're there, they see all these plagues fall on the Egyptian people. Moses comes, all these plagues come, and finally, after the firstborn son of every Egyptian family is killed, the Pharaoh says, let them go. And they all come out of Egypt, and they all go to... Are you okay? And they all go to the corner where the Red Sea is. And they all go to the Red Sea, and all of a sudden they hear the thunder of the horses and the chariots of the Egyptian army, and they see water... And they see the army coming to get them. And all of a sudden, God drops a cloud down around them. And Moses touches the water, and the sea splits apart. I mean, can you imagine you're walking out and, and on, on the, the sea floor? There's, there's fish flopping around. Someone's old, like, 30-year-old axe they dropped in the water. Some old fishing lines. And they're walking across all this stuff. And they hear the army of the Egyptians coming along into the riverbed behind them, and they, and they go up, they get out, and the Lord closes the water, and it wipes them all away. Now, would you not think you've seen a great miracle of God? I mean, wouldn't you think for a moment, gee, if I was ever going to believe that God is able, it's now. Led by a pillar of fire by day and cloud by night, wouldn't you think, gee, this God that I'm worshiping, maybe he's real. Maybe he's good. Maybe he's powerful. And and they go along, and they're going through, and they come to the promised land. And they come to the promised land, and Moses says, every tribe, all 12 tribes, is to send out one spy to the land. We pick up in Numbers 13 up here, verses 25 through 33. Numbers 13, 25 through 33. So the 12 spies go out for 40 days, and they come back from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and all the Israelites get together. They're all in this part of the desert. They're all together. They get around the 12 spies at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them in the whole assembly and they showed them the fruit of the land. They gave this account to Moses. We went into the land to which you said us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. Can you imagine? God promised this stuff. They go and they find it exactly like he said. God fulfilling his promise. Just like he said. They even have like the, the grapes, the size of watermelons, the awesome strawberries, they had like five bucks a pound for. They've got it all. And they say, look at all the stuff. Here it is. I mean, everything God has promised is coming to pass. He's been faithful. He's doing everything that he promised, just like he said. Here is the fruit. And now the majority of the spies say this, but the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there, and of the giants. These are the ten-foot people. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb, okay, so there's the report. Ten out of twelve are saying, these people are going to kill us. 
It'll be like going to our slaughter if we walk into this land that God has told us to go into. And then who stands up? Caleb. And he quiets the people and he says, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who went up and the other, the other, the other ten spies, not Caleb and uh, Joshua, but the other ten said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, this land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim, the, Nephil, the, the giants, the descendants of Anak. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. How much is that like us? I mean, we, we know the promise of God, the goodness of God, the ability of God, and yet for some reason we look at the stuff around us. We say, you know, God says we can do this, but look at, look at all this circumstance. Look at these situations. This is terrible. How can God ever give us victory in the midst of this? I mean, we, even, we can even, in the church, we say, well, you know, we don't have enough people or enough income or enough this or not good enough programs or whatever it is, and we fix our eyes on the things that we don't have instead of on the power of God and what he can do and what he's promised us. And we do it all the time. We walk around aware of what we don't have instead of in love with the God who gives us all that we need. Who always creates a way. Who always fulfills and matches his promises. Their eyes were on themselves and what they lacked. And Caleb's eyes were on the power and the promise and the goodness of God. And I think we have that disparity oftentimes in the church. Caleb stands up in the worst of reports begging the people to follow the promise of God. Numbers 14, verses 7 through 10, we see Caleb continue. Numbers 14, 7 through 10. The people are saying, we're not going to go into the promised land. We're going to run away. We're going to go back to Egypt, go back to slavery. And Caleb said to the entire assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. This guy does everything right. Believe in the promise of God. He's yelling, waving his arms. God is good. He'll be faithful. He's been faithful at every turn. Trust him again, please. And these people say, the heck with you. Can you imagine how you'd feel? I mean, you ever have that happen? You know, like you want something to get done and you leave like very clear instructions, you know, and, and you set all the pieces in place and everything's there. All the person's got to do is just do it. Just walk through the door. Take them by the hand. Here it is. Here's the door. Go in. I don't. Refuse. I mean, you can't imagine what Caleb must have felt.
And so for 45 years, Caleb is punished with all the other people in Israel for not believing that God would fulfill his promise and entering into the land that God called him to. You ever, you ever know ever, ever know that you deserve something? Something should be done, right? You set it up, only it doesn't happen. I mean, if that happens around here, I'm, I'm going to get on the phone and, you know, within a couple of weeks and say, where is my thing? For 45 years, he has to wait. For 45 years, he walks with Joshua and buries all of his friends. That entire generation of people dies before they enter the promised land. And he comes to Joshua before they're going to enter this land. Forty-five years later, we pick it up in Joshua 14.10, up here. We've already read it. He comes in, and he goes to Joshua. Forty-five years later, he says, Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to Moses, when Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. Next one, 11, is there? He says, I am still as strong to this day as I was the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for coming and going. Verse 12, so now give me the hill country. Oh, he's 85! I mean, I know so many Christians that would become bitter and angry having to wait that long. Do you, anyone know any, 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 any Christians that are bitter and angry? Because something happened that shouldn't have happened and it wasn't fair and they walk around mad? We talk about, we talk about character. I mean, what kind of a man is able to say, God, you're still going to be faithful 45 years later? And yeah, I'm 85, but I'm able to walk and fulfill the promise you gave me so many years ago. I'm, I'm willing to be faithful. I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to know that you are going to do what you promised, even if it takes me 45 years more to get there. And not only that, he gets there and he says, give me the, the land where the giants are, where the big fortified cities are, where the guys that are like and Shaquille O'Neal are swinging axes. I want to fight those guys at 85. I mean, who doesn't want to be that guy or woman? I mean, it's an example of, of trusting God. And you know what he does at 85? He takes the land with his descendants, fully victorious. He, he takes over Hebron, the very important territory in the history of God's people. You know, and, and, when, and when God picks Joshua to replace Moses, he doesn't get mad. You ever see that? Wait a minute, God, I spoke up. Joshua was wimpy. He didn't speak up. He said over in the corner, let me take all the heat. Yet, yet God picked him. So Caleb's not mad. In fact, he honors Joshua. He goes to Joshua and says, I honor you as the leader of my people. I am asking you for my promise again. Because now you're the leader. Now you're the mouthpiece of God. Now you're the one who's going to show me if, if the promise that I think is mine is mine. I honor you as my leader. And honor is a huge thing for God in the kingdom. We're called to honor each other, to honor our leadership, to honor God and his word, 
his promises. And so we see Caleb honoring God. Do you all, if you all remember when we talked about this before, do we know what the secret is? Do we know what the secret is? How can someone live so ridiculously faithful and encouraged and positive and victorious in life? We find the secret in three places. The first one is Joshua 14.8. Joshua 14.8, Caleb is talking about himself. My brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord, my God, fully, completely, with all of myself. Then we see Joshua's testimony in Joshua 14.14. 14. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since because what? He followed the Lord, the God of Israel, fully wholeheartedly, completely. The last one for me is, is the best. It's Numbers 14, verse 24. God says that every one of the Israelites who refused to go into the promised land would not see the promised land before they died, except because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me fully, wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Does anyone else love that? I mean, so powerful for us to say, God, I'm going to follow you fully. Even when things don't go my way, even when I see how good it's going to be, but I've got to wait 45 years. I mean, who thinks that's going to be possible? I have a hard time with 45 minutes or 45 days. That's ridiculous. I mean, I'm ready to call Bruce and file a lawsuit. And I want to be clear. God does not want us to suffer. That's not, that's not anything that's in God's heart. People make choices all the time that affect us and affect others. And God, we know, is always at work for our good in everything. But for us to be able to stand on God's promises, knowing that God is faithful, knowing that he is able in every situation, will change the kind of believers that we are. We'll be able to be the kind of person that brings about the kingdom of God in the places that we live and work with and interact in. When we know this God, when we stand with, with this God who is able, with this God who abounds in love and loves in power in ways the world has, has never seen as a hard time appreciating, understanding, contemplating, as we stand for that, the world is different because of us. We're called by Christ to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth as it is in heaven. Who, who likes that? Anybody? A few of you? Anybody else back there thinking about it but didn't repent? You guys, God is so awesome. He's so worth it. I mean, if there was anybody who was ever worth it, it's him. The one, the one person to make a fool of yourself over. You know, I mean, when, when I started doing the, the, the school supernatural ministry stuff and they told us to go out into the streets, I was terrified of doing that. But I said, is there, is there anybody who's worth embarrassing myself for? And it's God. And the thing is, as we begin to pray and believe and, and trust that God can do some of these things, and we see them happen, we're changed forever. I mean, we're changed forever. I believe in my heart that God wants us to live that way. Knowing the truth, knowing his word well in our minds, and then experiencing his love and his power 
through every interaction, through every event and experience that we have in our lives. And I'll tell you what, if, that's your, if that can become your journey, you're so on fire for God, you can't turn it off. And I, you know, and I, I love it. I love when you come to me and say, you won't believe what happened. We prayed for his 32-year-old brother with a massive heart attack and was having failing organs. Now all of a sudden, he's a new special because he's alive and well and thriving and healthy. That's, that's it for me. And God has that for each of us. It's not only for a few. It's for everyone who wanted to dare to follow the Lord their God fully. Okay, I could preach for another hour or so, but I think you all get my heart for this. Let's pray together. Lord God, I can't help but get excited when we talk about following you, about knowing you, about seeing you at work in love and in power in our lives, in our church, in our homes, in our gyms, in our restaurants, in our movie theaters. Wherever it is that you lead us, we're to be those agents that bring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let us love boldly and risk ourselves in trusting that you are who you say you are, that you are able, that you are good, that your love overcomes a multitude of wrongs, that you are healer, you are Savior, Lord Jesus. May we be encouraged. May we learn today from Caleb what it means to be faithful, to trust, to follow you fully. Lord God, may that be the words that you use to describe our lives as we continue to pursue you with joy in Christ. Amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. And thank you.